Thank you, um, uh, uh, Greg, for your um, very generous set of comments and for your leadership of VAC, uh, along with um, Simon as CEO and the work of the staff. I think it is very important that you have recognised that because this is a very important body. Can I also acknowledge David Menadieu, the VAC board member, um, and recently, until recently on the Elford board, past presidents and CEOs of VAC, Sean Straub, the founder of POS magazine, Mary Valentine, CEO of the Recital Centre, I believe is here, Mark Orr, and Nick Parkville from ACON, and it's important that the links, particularly with New South Wales, are strong and I welcome them here today. I also um, think my uh, ministerial colleague, Mary Wooldridge, may be here. If she's not, she was certainly intending to get here. And I saw uh, Gavin Jennings, my um, opposition parliamentary colleague, here. And Gavin, one of the things about the Victorian response to HIV is the bipartisan nature of that response, and I intend to uh, maintain that. I wish to... <laughs> I, I do want to acknowledge the traditional owners um, of the land on which we're meeting, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, although I do take the point that was made before about the, the many other elders who are in the room tonight. Um, it is a pleasure with AIDS 2014 in Melbourne. Uh, I am very proud as a Melbourneian, as an Australian, uh, to be here um, and to, um, to have this uh, magnificent conference here. I do also want to, uh, at the start, acknowledge people with HIV and those who have lost friends and colleagues and partners uh, to the virus. VAC has uh, created an outstanding program for AIDS 2014. This includes the very successful Global Forum on Men Who Have Sex With Men and HIV, to fielding volunteers at the airport, undertaking engagement tours and running a forum with the San Francisco AIDS Foundation to discuss the place of PrEP in our prevention response. Uh, VAC has been leading the fight, as was said, uh, for over 30 years in Victoria. The agency was created by passionate, dedicated gay activists who stepped up three decades to take care of their community. And today, VAC has an array of services, uh, such as outreach, clinical, counselling, uh, financial, legal, home care and peer education, many of which are provided importantly by dedicated volunteers. The Victorian Government and VAC have worked together on many innovative initiatives. In the last year, we partnered on the establishment of Pronto, the first peer-led community-based chop front for HIV and more lately syphilis rapid testing in Australia. Um, the idea to establish uh, Pronto um, it came as a result of my visit to Magnet, the rapid testing centre in San Francisco in 2012, um, and talks with Professor Kenneth Mayer uh, from the Free Fenway Institute in Boston, where I went uh, at the time of the International Conference in Washington in 2012. And I think Graham Brown is here tonight too. He was with me when I attended um, at um, Magnet. The Victorian AIDS Council and the Burnett have turned this idea into a reality and we now have a first class pilot centre that has been operating in Fitzroy since last August. We need to remove the barriers to testing, normalise the process, improve testing rates amongst gay men and men who have sex with men if we are to shrink the pool of people who have undiagnosed HIV. I am aware that VAC has begun a trial period of outreach rapid testing at key locations and I will be interested to hear uh, how this approach works in engaging men in testing. As you know, or as you're aware, in 2013, Victoria recorded the highest number of new HIV diagnoses in a single year since the height of the epidemic in the early 1990s. And to significant extent, this is part, partly the, the result of more testing. It's actually what we want. Um, we actually want to uncover um, uh, undiagnosed HIV and enable early testing or early treatment to uh, begin. 
Um, over the last two years, there have been a number of interventions aimed at promoting testing that led by VAC, and if these are effective, I fully expect to see increases in notifications for a period of time. To ensure we can measure the effectiveness of responses, the government has increased funding for the Access Plus Sentinel sur surveillance system. The new system, or this new system is the best in the country and has started to provide key data on test rates, positivity rates, trends and incidents across a range of blood-borne viruses. The system has recorded a 16.5% 16 16 increase in the number of men or the number of HIV tests at high caseload clinic in 2013. Um, the increase in HIV testing has been driven by more men testing as opposed to increased frequency of testing of men who already had been tested. Rapid testing has had a role to play in this increase. In the lead up to AIDS 2014, the COAG Health Council endorsed the AIDS 2014 legacy statement. And I pay tribute particularly to the work of Ministers Skinner and Dutton in that process and was proud to be part of a series of round tables in New South Wales over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, this um, statement commits all Australian health ministers to achieving the virtual elimination of new transmissions, HIV transmissions, by the end of 2020. The statement was launched at the AIDS 2014 on Sunday by Professor Sharon Lewin, myself, and the New South Wales Minister for Health and Medical Research, Gillian Skinner. The goal of the statement was adopted in the seventh National HIV Strategy, which was launched by Federal Minister for Health, the Honourable Peter Dutton, um, last week. This is a challenging uh, target, given that over the last two years, Australia has recorded the largest number of new HIV cases in 20 years. It is also meant to be a galvanising target because we are at a tipping point in the fight against HIV in this country, and we have the tools to achieve this vision. In Victoria, to meet this target, we will need a rejuvenated partnership response. We will need to maintain support for high quality basic clinical and social research. We will need to implement and build evidence on the effectiveness of new combination prevention approaches. We will need to focus on health literacy in specific groups such as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I was again pleased to see that the new uh, tranche of national strategies included a significant focus on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, we will need to continue to ensure positive people and those affected by HIV are at the table. And we will need to renew our focus on challenging stigma and discrimination. On Sunday, I announced on behalf of the Victorian Coalition Government the decision to amend Section 19A of the Crimes Act 1958 to remove <laughs> its its discriminatory provisions in relation to the intentional transmission of HIV. The details of this amendment have yet to be finalised and will be clarified as part of the legislative process, and we will be consulting widely on that. Um, Michael Kirby noted at the Beyond Blame Forum that the tide is turning against stigma and discrimination, but as he puts it, haters remain, and there is still work to be done in the social and political arenas. To this end, I have requested that an HIV working group be established as part of the Departmental Advisory Committee on Bloodborne Viruses. The working group will be co-chaired by Associate Professor Edwina Wright, Senior Specialist in Infectious Diseases Physician at the Elford, and President of the Australian Australasian Society of HIV Medicine, and Dr Rosemary Lester, the Victorian Chief Health Officer. One of the first tasks of the working group will be to convene a forum to guide the development of Victorian HIV future directions towards achieving virtual elimination of HIV, particularly in the context of treatment and prevention science emerging from AIDS 2014. In the past two years, the Victorian Department of Health has funded a range of initiatives, and I'm not going to list them all because um, there is quite a number, but I, Pronto and PrEP, um, the Positive Ageing Project, Predict is associated with adherence to antiretroviral therapy uh, the, or, or the PART study. 
um, extra funding to maintain the provision of sexual health and treatment services for people with HIV, and increased, importantly, I think, increased funding for hepatitis B vaccination uh, to include gay men and people with HIV. I am confident if we continue our partnerships, and I also want to uh, pay tribute to the input from Mike Kennedy and the Ministerial Advisory Committee over the last period too. It's been a very important committee, and both myself and Minister Wooldridge uh, have a very high regard for the input that we have received from that committee. Uh, but with those comments, um, I, I think we are very fortunate to have AIDS 2014 here. It's a fantastic opportunity for Victoria and Australia. The terrible start in terms of the Malaysian airline flight is something that I think has had the effect, or, or I certainly feel, has had the effect of galvanising people in a positive direction. And um, I, I think that it may turn out that this has been a proud moment for the HIV community, for researchers, for activists, uh, but a proud moment more broadly across the world too. Thank you. Um, this has been uh, a peculiar conference with the excitement of seeing friends and, and the hope that comes from some of the work presented here uh, with um, having been started with such exceptional loss of people who are known to literally thousands of the people here at this conference and in such a, a, a tragic and senseless way. Um, but it did make me think about how experienced uh, those of us who've worked in the epidemic for so long are, uh, how we are more practiced with grief and suffered more pain and loss than most any human should ever have to endure. And we developed coping mechanisms to deal with that. Uh, often masked in a placid stoicism, but we, we learned to go on. Uh, and we learned that we had to pick ourselves up, sometimes crawling through a rubble of human destruction, uh, but to carry on and get the work done. Because while one person died, another person was dying, and another person needed their bedpan emptied. And that's what we saw this week. The tragedy you know, is felt so strongly, but people went on and the, the conferences continued. Uh, you know, in the very earliest days of the epidemic, uh, when it was just total fear and unknown, something magical happened that has reverberated through the next three and a half decades, and I hope long into the future, which is that people with AIDS we didn't have HIV then. People with AIDS got together with each other, and they became each other's best experts. No one else knew anything about it. We knew more about it than anyone else. And there were no treatments, uh, but what there was was what we could do for each other. Uh, to the extent that there was advocacy and sort of public work, it was around combating stigma, uh, around privacy and confidentiality issues patient autonomy and empowerment. It was a movement uh, codified in something called the Denver Principles. And I'm a long ways from Denver, but I'm just curious how many people have ever heard of the Denver Principles? That's pretty cool. The Denver Principles is the foundation document of the people with HIV empowerment movement. It is sort of the Constitution, Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, and Magna Carta all rolled into one. It outlines a series of rights and responsibilities for people with HIV and those who provide care to them. Uh, it starts with taking control of the language. It says, we reject the label victim because it implies passivity and defeat. We are only occasionally patients. We are people with AIDS. And from that document in June of 1983, it spawned uh, an amazing network. We created a parallel healthcare service delivery structure uh, in North America and, and very significantly here and elsewhere. Because the existing healthcare service delivery system, in many cases, it didn't care about us. Uh, and in most cases, it didn't know how to provide care to us. 
uh, and many didn't want to know that. So we went out and created our own organizations to provide service and to care for each other. But we did it on a different model. We didn't do it on the traditional benefactor victim model of service delivery. We created a peer-to-peer -peer model that was inspired by and really replicated the women's health movement of the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, where the personal truly was political and where we were using our own health situation as an instrument for change and supporting each other. Uh, I call it a do-it-yourself movement. We weren't looking to the federal government. We knew the Reagan administration was perfectly happy to let us die. We now see the notes from the Domestic Policy Council meetings where it was discussed that this was just nature taking its course. Um, so we weren't looking there. We looked to each other and found strength in each other. And sometimes you hear people speak about the early days of the epidemic with almost a nostalgia. And that nostalgia was how unified we were, how much we were caring for each other. Because it was beautiful. It was really, really, and truly something beautiful. Even with that phenomenal loss and pain, such a beauty came out of it. And it showed the very best face of what our queer community was about. At the beginning of the epidemic, uh, and I'm talking statistics from the US, but I don't know if they're too much different here, but 7% of the people in the United States said they knew someone who was gay or lesbian. 7%. Uh, so the epidemic really introduced to much of the world the gay guys living down the street introduced into the context of an epidemic. But what they saw with that was they saw strangers caring for each other. They saw people rearranging their lives so that they could stop in at their neighbor's apartment in the morning and change the diaper and do the dishes and then come back in in the evening after work to make them dinner. You saw people I get choked up when I think about this. You saw people who would get sick and they would run out of their vacation days. And their friends who knew what was going on, but it was a big secret because they didn't want them to get fired, would contribute vacation days so that person could stay out longer and try and get better to come back to work. You saw all sorts of, there was a restaurant in the theater district, Joe Allen's. And uh, Joe Allen's told its servers, uh, come in early for your shift and we'll make as many meals as you want to deliver to uh, people in the neighborhood who were sick and homebound. So every single day for several years, the Joe Allen waiters all came in an hour or two early and they, they got meals and they delivered them to the, a lot of the guys in the theater district who were dying. Um, then, as the deaths were mounting, and the anger in the community and the fear was continuing to escalate and was starting to focus more on the very poor response from uh, the federal government and the municipal government and elsewhere. Uh, and AZT came out and there started to be this pipeline. We're talking about drugs. There are various things in development. But the anger had gotten to such a point that uh, a sort of new stage of activism emerged that wasn't this sort of do-it-yourself focusing on people with HIV around these feminist health principles. Uh, it was a, an in-the-streets activism that was a combination of a real angry expression, uh, an exertion of muscle, and a kind of collective therapy in ACT UP uh, that was a driven. Uh, it wasn't comprised entirely of, but it was a driven in those first few years by gay white men of relative privilege who were indignant and angry to learn that their government was prepared to let them die because they had never before experienced that kind of, of neglect uh, and dismissal from the system in general. Now, lots of other people getting AIDS at the time, this wasn't new to them. <laughs> you know, it was like, hey, what's different today? Uh, but for a lot of these guys, uh, that's what happened. I always point out the very first ACT UP demonstration was, well, where would, where would a group of angry white gay guys in New York go to express anger? You know, where was the center of power they'd go to? The New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> that was the first demonstration. Um, uh, but that was incredibly effective, that anger. We made them afraid of us. And we expedited the research process. 
We expedited the regulatory process. Uh, we contributed mightily to, to research. And we brought the, uh, the treatments that worked to us much faster. And then in 1996, everything changed with the introduction of protease therapy. And all sorts of things changed. First of all, the prospect of survival changed for those of us who had been fortunate enough to survive to get to that point. And at that time, uh, I weighed 42 or 3 pounds less than I weigh right now. I had a viral load of 3.3 million and a CD4 count of 1. I was covered in Kaposi's sarcoma all over my face and legs and torso and in my lungs. So I was one of the very, very sick and very lucky to come back. It was, we called it the Lazarus effect. So, thank you. <laughs> um, but then other things started to happen. A lot of people whose engagement, and I don't say this in a way to, d to diminish their role, but their engagement in the activism was driven by a quest for their survival. And once they knew they were going to be able to survive or they had more confidence around that, they left AIDS activism. You know, they went back to their lives, back to their careers, their families, their other interests, and their other issues. Um, all sorts of, you know, a lot of people who got very sick and got better, they will tell you the more difficult time was after they got better. Dealing with the guilt of survival, dealing with changed relationships. The people around you had been relationships predicated on an assumption that you were going to die at some point and then you aren't dying. You know, you handled your personal finances and an expectation that you weren't going to be around to have to worry about it. <laughs> um, and, but something else happened, very important, that speaks directly to what we're faced with today, which is the perception of people with HIV changed. That up until then, no matter what kind of moral judgment someone might make about homosexuality or drug use or whatever, most people, I'd like to say all, maybe I'll be optimistic and say everybody, uh, had some measure of human compassion for people who had AIDS because there was the expectation they were going to die, probably very horrific death. Um, once it became understood we're not dying anymore and that we were going to be around longer and live, we started to be seen not so much as subjects of pity but as a threat. Being around longer meant we would be around to infect longer. So we began to be defined by the public health system and the criminal justice system as an inherent threat, an inherent risk to society. A population that needed to be tracked down, sought out, tested, listed, reported, tagged, numbered, regulated, controlled. There's an enormous, enormous change in the epidemic. Even as we had this miraculous medical development, we had a, 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 a horrific development in the role and the perception of people with HIV in our society. Um, in the next several years, the people with HIV empowerment movement uh, in many places, and I don't want to speak to, to Australia where I don't know, but it dissipated. The funding went away. Um, a lot of the most prominent activists either died or were burnt out or went on to other things. The epidemic was shifting into other communities, increasingly uh, a disease of the poor, of women, of young African American men, uh, gay men of color. Um, and you know, I think of the, the years in the late 90s and the early 2000s as kind of a, a lost part of, of, of the epidemic. Um, but a few years ago, when the understanding of how effective treatment is in preventing transmission uh, of the virus, a number of things started to change. The biomedical research became very focused and it was this real belief that we were going to treat ourselves out of the epidemic, that biomedical approaches, that was going to do it. Treat people, they won't be infectious. Uh, we promote, hopefully, post-exposure prophylaxis which is an emergency intervention that I think is a sin that it, if it's not available everywhere, people are finding themselves at risk. Um, uh, and more recently, the discussion about PrEP uh, that has been a very difficult and complicated discussion in the US. Uh, I hope 
that the discussion that we've had in the U.S. you can learn from here and kind of avoid this polarizing, you know, uh, um, uh, discourse that we've had. Uh, I am someone who I am absolutely positively for prep being available for people who will not or cannot use condoms, for passive partners who want to be able to control HIV prevention, for sex workers where it's economic, they can turn a lot fewer tricks if they can do it without a condom. Uh, you know, I think in, there are situations where it is a godsend. But I think the difference between making PrEP available to very specific communities and, and people who want to go on it and have this kind of particular need, that's one thing. But ro and, and it's proven if it's taken as effective, it's very, as, as uh, d d prescribed, it's very effective at, at avoiding HIV transmission. But that's very different from extrapolating that into a public health policy and going out and promoting it as a public health policy. Because what happens with every new miracle drug or introduction, there are unintended uh, consequences. And I'm, I don't believe we have looked at the potential unintended consequences of PrEP nearly enough. Um, I think that PrEP, even though in the US its official FDA approval is in conjunction with condoms, uh, it's kind of wink, wink, nod, nod, because it's being promoted uh, uh, implicitly as a substitute for condoms. Uh, we are already seeing dramatic rise in syphilis rates and rectal syphilis in particular. Um, uh, you can't pin that on PrEP specifically, but I think you can attribute it uh, in part to a growing confidence in biomedical prevention. Uh, some of us believe that there is a chance, I hope that, I'm one of the people who believe this, I hope that I'm wrong, that widespread promotion of PrEP as a major public health strategy that ends up reducing the effort on other kinds of prevention strategies could make the epidemic worse. And this is something that needs to be studied. While we have a lot of research showing how effective PrEP is on an individual basis at preventing HIV transmission, we have virtually no research showing what it will do as a public health strategy or on a community-wide basis. Uh, and this is one of the really central arguments of our time. But the other thing that's happening with it, uh, PrEP is, is part of this, uh, is that there's a realization, I think, that has grown in the last several years, and we really have seen it at this conference, which has been wonderful in this way, uh, an understanding we're not going to be able to treat ourselves out of the, out of the epidemic. You know, we get all the talk, oh, the end of the epidemic is near, we have the tools, this and that, that kind of, you know, PRE rhetoric that no one really believes, but apparently they have to say that. But now there seems to be uh, a recognition by, by many of the powers that be that the communities most directly affected have to be brought into this, uh, more like in the way we were in the early years and a lot less like it was in the, in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Because there's no pill for stigma. Uh, uh, and so when we bring people with HIV back into it and focus on the communities that are the very, very most affected, transgender women, people who are incarcerated, migrants and immigrants, young people, women, especially young uh, gay men of color, uh, when we are focusing on those communities, and bringing them in, into the conversation, that's such a kind of like a cliche kind of thing, but really make it for real. You know, make them the center of the effort and empower them to be developing the policy in partnership with technical experts and implementing the programs, serving on the boards of directors of the provider organizations so that it is along this peer-to-peer -peer model not the benefactor victim model, but in the US, a lot of the AIDS organizations that were started on this peer-to-peer -peer model have kind of reverted back to the benefactor victim model. Agencies that once had boards of directors that were entirely people with AIDS or HIV and their partners now don't have any, or maybe only have a token one. So I think if we can look at these things, things like removing the legal barriers, 
this, you know, 19A in Victoria that the minister announced the other day, they were going to look at amending it. No, amending it, I mean, I'll say it, amending it is bullshit. It is absolutely bullshit. There is no reason to have an HIV-specific statute. It is, by definition, discriminatory. Government should not make a different law for different parts of society based on immutable characteristics. Whether it is your skin color, your gender, your sexual orientation, your physical ability or disability, your genetic makeup, and yet here we're doing it with HIV, creating special laws just for people with HIV, creating a viral underclass in the law of people with inferior rights to everyone else. The intent to harm someone, a malicious intent to transmit HIV and harm someone, that can be uh, prosecuted under assault statutes. The assault statutes, whether someone uses a gun or a knife or their fists or a virus, if they intend to harm someone, they can be prosecuted. You don't need to have this separate statute that is so highly stigmatizing uh, and is so discourages people from getting tested and erodes the confidence of people who have uh, HIV in cooperating with public health. Getting rid of 19A is an HIV prevention strategy. Yeah. You, you, you can prevent HIV or you can prosecute it. You can't do both. Um, in closing, the last thing I want to say is I want to quote something from a poem by Auden called The More Loving One, if anyone knows it. And I'll just read the first two parts of it because I think it is so beautiful and it is so reflective of what the community of people with HIV and the LGBT community and our closest allies who have been there and who have you know, held those dying hands and emptied those bedpans and written those checks and done all those things for so many years. Um, we have consistently been the more loving ones. So Auden's poem goes, looking up at the stars, I know quite well that for all they care, I can go to hell. But on earth, Indifference is the least we have to dread from man or beast. How should we like it if the stars, if how should we like it were stars to burn with a passion for us when we could not return? If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. Thanks. week and an amazing couple of days. We didn't realise this would end up being so much about criminalisation in Victoria when we started this, um, but the Minister's announcement on Sunday certainly brought tears to my eyes as I announced it at the MSM Global Forum. And I know Paul Kidd told me he sat in a toilet and had a bit of a cry to himself, so um, it's been a big few days. We had 5,000 people march down Flinders Street today. It, it, it was amazing and um, Phil Carswell has told me about the first candlelight vigil which was two guys standing on the side of the road with everyone pointing at them and staring at them. So we've certainly come a long way. Uh, I got my hair cut last week and the hair... Thank you. And, <laughs> and, and the hairdresser asked me what I did for a living and I told him I worked for the AIDS Council and he said, oh you mean AIDS AIDS? And I said, yes, HIV AIDS. And he said, oh yeah, what happened with that? <laughs> and I explained that the conference was coming, that he'd hear a lot more about it in the coming days. And then he said, you should run Red Raw dance parties again. They were great. <laughs> and I had to point out that they bankrupted the organisation that did run them. Uh, the Victorian AIDS Council is the oldest AIDS organisation in the country. 31 years and two months ago, we were created at the Laird Hotel. Uh, right now, at 50 Lonsdale Street at the Department of Health, there is an exhibit, a photographic exhibition called The Legends, and it features 16 <coughs> photos of people who set up our organisation and Living Positive Victoria's organisation who have since passed to HIV and Positive Women's Organisation 
Uh, but I just want to acknowledge that there are a number of people in this room tonight who were at that meeting. I'm not going to name them all because I'll miss them, but there are a number of living legends here tonight, and we thank them for creating our organisation and putting us together. <laughs> I, I would also like to thank my amazing staff team who I love dearly, particularly when they dress me in the morning and they feed me lunch and they straighten my tie and they go out and buy me ridiculously expensive scarves to put in my pocket. Uh, and particularly the ones who manage up and, and get me to calm down when I'm not quite so calm as I haven't been this week. I'd like to thank all of our interstate and international guests. Uh, our new motto is working together and today we saw how 5,000 people can work together as they walk down the street. And I made a quick list of the organisations in the room, I've probably missed some, but we work together with Li Living Positive Victoria, Positive Women, Straight Arrows, Alfred Health, Royal Melbourne Health, the Department of Health, AFAO, ACON, Quack, NTAC, WAC, TASCARD, the MSM Global Forum, Clinton Health Access, VACHO, RDNS, the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, Archers and Burnett. If I've missed you, I'm sorry, but thank you for partnering with, with us and we couldn't do that without you. Okay. We, we, we need to thank the musicians as well who are playing for us tonight. Harry Bennett, Taboo, Pavlich, Hobber, William Clark and Hennessy. They, have, they are volunteering their time like the 600 other people who are volunteering for us this week. Now, the drinks are paid for, the food is paid for, so please enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.